Let's return to our test cross. Crossing a hybrid, big A, little a, big B, big B, little, I'm sorry, big B, little B, with a homozygote recessive. And remember that the value of a test cross is that the phenotypes of the progeny directly reflect the genotypes of the gametes that are produced by this, sorry, produced by this heterozygote. And so the progeny that we expect to see, the phenotypes of these progeny will be big A, big B, big A, little b, little a, big b, and little a, little b. And if these genes a and b are unlinked, we expect to see equal numbers of all four of these progeny, right? Equal numbers of these gametes and so equal numbers of the phenotypes that are reflected in the progeny of the test cross. Now, let's assume that we see something different. So in this uh, particular instance, let's put some numbers to this and say that we see 226 instances of both of those traits being dominant, 114 instances of the A trait dominant, 102 instances of the B trait dominant, and 202 instances of both of the traits being recessive. And so the question is, if we have a hypothesis that the actual ratio, if these are unlinked, that we will expect to see is a one to one to one to one ratio, does this data fit this hypothesis? Well, whenever you have a genetic hypothesis that predicts some ratio of offspring, and you want to see if your data fits this hypothesis, the first thing you should think of is a chi-square test, right? And so I will spare you the math, but the chi-square test statistic here is 72. And with three degrees of freedom, the p-value is way, way, way less than 0.001. Right, so there is definitely something going on here. There is good evidence to reject this hypothesis and suggest that something else is happening. Right, this hypothesis, we come to the conclusion that, um, that, that we expect to see these because of the hypothesis that these genes are unlinked. And so an alternate hypothesis might be that genes A and B are linked. And so let's Go ahead and test that hypothesis. I'm going to do this over here, perhaps. So if our hypothesis is that A and B are linked, then let's go ahead and choose the homozygous dominant and the homozygous recessive as the parental types. And we'll see why in the next video that um, that that assumption makes some sense. And if that's the case, then that means that these types are the recombinants. And thus, we expect that if this hypothesis is true, that there will be a one-to-one -one ratio of parental and recombinants. Oh, I'm sorry. If A and B are unlinked, I'm sorry, still under this hypothesis, that there's a one-to-one -one ratio of parental and recombinants. And so how many parental observations did we have? Well, 226 plus 202 is 428. And how many recombinant gametes did we see? Well, 114 and 102 is 216. And so now our null hypothesis, remember that our genes are unlinked, predicts this one-to-one -one ratio. And again, we can run with a chi-squared test. And again, I'm going to elide the math and jump straight to the fact that the chi-squared test, test statistic 
is 69.7, which again gives you a p-value that is way, way less than 0 0.0001. And so again, this way of looking at it by separating our gametes into parental types and recombinant types and then asking, well, or do they have a one-to-one -one ratio, right? This can be another test of this hypothesis that they're unlinked versus the alternate that they might be linked. And I will also note that it could also be that they are, you know, there is some homeos, uh, I'm sorry, there is, um, some epistasis happening or some other kind of gene to gene interactions that are throwing this off. But this is one possible way that linked genes might show up in this kind of data. So what have we learned? Well, if we are in a genetic situation like this with a test cross where we can distinguish recombined gametes from non-recombined gametes, then we can test this hypothesis, right? That the two loci are linked by looking at this frequency of recombination, right? Because loci that are physically closer together recombine less frequently, the observed frequency of recombination can actually be used as a metric of, source, of sorts, like a measure of genetic distance between two genes. And this idea and how it's used to map genes is our next topic.